Welcome everyone tonight to the Central Pennsylvania World War II Roundtable meeting here. Happy New Year everyone, it's 2023. We hope we're off to a good start here tonight and uh, this week here, the new year. Uh, I'll introduce the speaker here a little bit, but uh, before I do the general remarks and the speaker uh, introduction, I wanna have us uh, honor the flag and, uh, and, and Ed will do the, uh, Miller will do the Pledge of Allegiance for us and, and we'll do that, start, start us off that way, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, um, I guess maybe Charlie could have that. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, so, uh, our, we're going to do our general remarks, then we'll get to the speaker intro. So, as we usually do, um, I want to thank all the veterans here tonight. I know a lot of you are veterans, and uh, appreciate that. And do we have any World War II veterans here tonight? I'm not sure. I don't. I, we usually have them up front. Do we have any here? Oh, yeah. Let's give a round of applause. Yes, we have a couple in the back. Thank you. Th thanks for putting your hands up and thanks for being here tonight. Really appreciate that. You're one of the big reasons why we do what we do and we want to respect and honor you. Thank you. Um, so I do have to do some general kind of um, announcements as far as we do appreciate if you can shut your cell phones down to off or silence so that we don't have any incoming calls or texts or anything that we hear during the meeting. And um, also uh, uh, we, we welcome you to give uh, contributions if you'd like to. It's not required, but uh, we do have operating expenses sometimes, and we, well, we do every month, actually. And we appreciate any donations that you can make and be so kind as to do. We have our gentleman in the back at the end of the meeting uh, with actual genuine, genuine uh, World War II helmets to, uh, they can take your donations in there, uh, check cash or whatnot, if you be so kind. But once again, that's not required, so don't feel like you have to pay anything if you don't want to, but you can. Oh. Uh, okay. Yes, I want to keep my remarks somewhat brief. So. Um, I do want to say before I go to Colin, though, that our next month speaker will be Dr. Michael Berkner. He's a full professor at the, uh, Gettysburg College here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a um, very historic as well town. Uh, he'll be speaking about a book that he wrote called Democracy's Shield. And that's about, uh, he's about 700 oral histories from uh, World War II veterans, U.S. and, and also U.S. civilians um, from the home front during the war. And so he will um, be happy to talk about that. And he will, he will also be selling copies of his books when he comes too. So if you'd like to buy any of his books, not just the Demo Democracy Shield, but other ones he's written too, uh, then please uh, make arrangements for that or uh, bring some funds for that. Um, okay, so now our, our honor speaker, Dr. Colin Colburn here uh, from the University of Delaware. So he had a significant drive to get here tonight. Uh, we appreciate him coming. Uh, he was highly recommended by uh, Dr. Saibhavan, who's spoken for us on a couple occasions already, also University of Delaware professor. Um, so Colin speaks about, uh, sorry, he uh, teaches about history at University of Delaware. Uh, he also is the lead historian for a group called Project Recover. And so some of you might say, what is Project Recover? Well, Colin will tell you more than, I, than me, but just briefly, uh, they helped to re relocate uh, remains of US service members, including World War II ones. And as the lead historian, he researches a lot about the history but he's also deeply involved with the actual uh, missions that go across the world to find the remains and to bring back those uh, remains to have closure for the families and also to have them proper burial for them back home in the United States of America. Uh, that's also very important and critical. And the federal government does that too in their own uh, um, branch of work in that, in that area. But also, um, this, is, this is another group that is sponsored by the University of Delaware and other, other funders um, to also do the similar type work as well. Uh, so Colin's written uh, some books on the U.S. Marine Corps as well. He's a specialist on uh, his PhD in U.S. military history, and uh, he's taught about these uh, subjects as well, including World War II. So he, uh, he's going to be talking tonight about Operation Hailstone, which was the U.S. carrier-borne attack by carrier planes and carriers on Truck Lagoon in the Pacific Theater against the Japanese forces that were there at that, at that time. And so he has a nice PowerPoint presentation to show us tonight, and um, please enjoy his presentation. I'll hand things over to Colin. Thanks, thanks for coming, Colin, and, and good luck in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Chris, Charlie, um, Cliff, Mike, others I have met. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, thank you again for coming. I'm gonna slowly back away. Um, <clears throat> quick caveat, I, uh, uh, you know, as many of us have over the winter, I got a little crud, so I apologize. I'm going to try not to hack right into the microphone here. Uh, thankfully, it's not COVID, but I'm right at the tail end of it, so if I, I'm going to try to get my, my voice up to do this whole thing. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Colin Colborn. Ready for that when you want to help. You're good. Sweet. Cool picture. SPD Dauntless flying over Truck Lagoon. The World War II veterans that are here. Is there any people who were at Truck? Because you guys can give the lecture if so, otherwise I don't need to do it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, just a few little things before I get started. So this is about Operation Hailstone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, first, we're going to talk about a quick overview of Operation Hailstone, uh, which was the U.S. Navy carrier attack on truck in 1944, February 17 to 18 local time, 1944. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, pe people who are into World War II probably have heard of this, but if, if you're not into World War II, most people don't really know too much about it. Um, Today, this place is, is called Chuk. It's got a whole, all the islands have different names, but for today, I'm gonna go back to World War II and we're gonna use the original island names as we, as they, uh, <coughs> as they use them um, in 1944. Um, we lost 20 aircraft um, with pilots and crews. And part of our mission, I'm gonna talk about in the second half of the presentation here, um, is to talk to you about what we do at Project Recover what we started doing um, in Chuuk uh, in 2018 um, to start to go and search for some of those pilots who went down in the lagoon. And so I'll give you some of their stories, uh, but first let's dive, <clears throat> let's dive a little bit into, um, a little bit into uh, Hailstone. Ah, truck. So uh, in the history report, sometimes you'll see uh, it says uh, lost at Truck Island or the the attack on Truck Island. Well, Truck Lagoon is a lagoon. It's a fringing coral reef. It's about 60, it's about say 40 miles across in each direction. It's about 2,000 square kilometers. Um, and inside are dozens of islands, um, usually mountainous. Some of the bigger ones are mountainous islands. It's, uh, it's an absolutely beautiful place. And um, when the carrier pilots first saw it, before the bombs started dropping, I'm sure it was quite surreal. Um, this is an awesome map that I found in what's called the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, which was uh, a survey carried out by the Air Force after the war where they basically went to individual islands with the captured Japanese and they, they said, hey, how did we do? Did, did we do a good job? How was the bombing? How did that feel? Um, and so they filled out these hundreds of pages of reports. And interestingly, this report on Truck was done. Uh, Truck was a bypassed island, a bypassed group of islands. Uh, we never invaded. And so the occupation of Truck did not even start until November of 1945. But the Strategic Bombing Survey went in in October before we even had a presence there and uh, were interviewing the Japanese who were captured on that island. Uh, but just a great visualization to sort of get an idea. Uh, I'm going to use my pointer here. Most of the Japanese activity is going to be in this group here. Hopefully you guys can see my pointer okay. And uh, we're going to zoom in. We're going we're to look at, at some of these islands in detail. So let's take a look at the Central Pacific. Uh, one of the things I love to do uh, is to show this, you know, the technology we have now. I can, it's just like looking at a globe. I can show how big the Pacific theater was. So when we're talking about Europe, we're talking about miles, we're talking about a few miles here and there. We're talking about the Pacific. We're talking about traveling thousands of miles at a time. And let me just show you here. Here's a truck right down here. 
So here's Hawaii off to the east over here. You can see Rabal, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands down over here. So what was truck? Why was truck important? Well, the U.S. called truck the Gibraltar of the Pacific. And we didn't know much about it at all. In fact, the only intel we had on truck was from British photographs that were taken in the 1910s, nature, nature photographs that they had taken in the 1910s. Um, a Marine, Pete Ellis, uh, tried to go there to do a survey in the 1920s, but was denied entry. It was quite a mystery. But as you can see from its location, when you think about the Japanese line, right, of defense, where they had all their uh, assets, it was in perfect position to stage stuff. Whether it's the Navy, it has an amazing, beautiful, uh, it, of course, it's fringed by coral reefs, so it's well protected from uh, invasion and attack. It uh, has up to 200 foot depths inside the lagoon. So it's perfect for anchoring super battleships and other large carriers. And it had four uh, airfields, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and what it was is it was a place for the Japanese to take stuff from Japan and stage it so they could move out to the east if they need, down to the south if they need, up to the north if they need, as the U.S. was approaching and the war was uh, progressing. So it was a very large naval base, and I think I mentioned the U.S., they sort of, they called it, you know, sort of the Japanese Pearl Harbor right there, their big naval base away from Japan. Um, and so as we're approaching the battle, um, just building up this idea of truck as this major, uh, major base. And you can see here too, you know, this is the Central Pacific Drive starting with Tarawa by the U.S. in December 1943, moving up through Kwajalein in January of 44. You can see how we're moving this way. You have to take truck in order to take the Mariana Islands or Palau. And so it's a key piece uh, of, of infrastructure that we need to attack, that the U.S. needs to attack at the time. Okay, let's see what we need for this here. The Japanese Navy, of course, had the entire combined fleet often stationed at truck at different times. These are the two super battleships that many of you uh, who read a lot of history will know, the Musashi and the Yamato. This is taken in 1943. They're probably, you know, when, what we do with Project Recover, and I'll talk about this extensively, is we, we map the sea floor looking for lost aircraft. And as you'd imagine, what we found in truck is also an entire history of the Japanese um, occupation there. Sake bottles and tossed things, anchors, all these kind of things, and it shows you know, how great the uh, Japanese occupation was. And I often look at this photo and I think about, you know, this is 1943, they probably just sank the USS Hornet at the Battle of Santa Cruz, and they're probably thinking things are doing okay. You know, maybe we're gonna lose Guadalcanal, you know, we're gonna lose the Solomon Islands, but maybe things will be okay. Not the case. So, let's talk about what the Japanese have in terms of defenses at truck. Now, I apologize, I know this is a little bit farther, farther away from you guys. So as I mentioned, what's very different about this than, than many other places is there's so many airfields. They had, they basically built airfields out of entire island. This island here called Aten, as you can see with the, the black line here. Basically, they cut the mountain out of the whole thing and just made it one giant island carrier. Same thing with this island over here, Param Island. That became the fighter strip uh, where they had hundreds of fighters um, stationed in and out. Uh, and then the main bomber strip was located up north here on Moen Island. Uh, there was another, uh, another strip under construction here on the south end. But for now, before uh, that never got completed, where these two arrows are pointing to here were the two seaplane bases. Now, the US, of course, we had seaplanes, but the Japanese really used seaplanes as a part of their air system. And so they had hundreds and hundreds of seaplanes at truck 
um, is these two, uh, these two seaplane ramps here. And I'll talk a little bit about a few of them and uh, I'll show you what they looked like, of course, after the raid. The main island of Japanese administration is this one here, which I think looks like a duck, but my friends, my colleagues don't think that it does. I don't know. It looks like a duck to me. That's called Dublon. Uh, American pilots often called it Dublin because it sounded, sounds like uh, what it should be. Um, Dublon was the main Japanese administration. It was where the 4th Fleet headquarters was. The combined fleet headquarters was on Dublon. It was essentially the place where everything happened. Now, when the Americans eventually come in after the war, this is going to be the main island. So when you fly in a truck today, you're actually going to fly in on this airstrip up here. But in 1944, Dublin, as we're going to talk about quite a bit when we talk about the, the attacks, was one of the major targets. Several fighter units were located there, <clears throat> and the Japanese 52nd Division um, was also located there. But they had less than 8,000 troops um, spread across all of the islands. And again, you know, going back to what you saw with that, that uh, what truck looked like. In fact, the U.S. even did a, uh, a ransom war games to see uh, Holland Smith, a Marine general, actually ran some war games um, to see if they could invade the truck. And there was, they just decided there was absolutely no way that it could do that, that it had to be assaulted from the air and it had to be a bypassed island, a bypassed uh, group of islands. So what are the Japanese aircraft um, that we're going to see here? In the strategic bombing survey, <clears throat> the Japanese actually had, they listed 35 to 40 aircraft, different types of aircraft that were all present at Truck Lagoon. As I mentioned, this is a place where they are going to be bringing assets in from, uh, from Japan, from up from um, New Guinea and the Solomons as the U.S. is pushing up that um, Southwest Pacific Drive. And... <clears throat> um, so they are going to have all kinds of aircraft, including, interestingly, Project Africa, we, we located um, two uh, seaplanes that were two of only six ever created. They all went down to the Pacific and were never seen. And we found two of those aircraft. Um, uh, very interesting seaplanes. What we have here, though, is the, uh, you know, the most common ones you're going to see are the Betty. Uh, Betty bomber, two-engine bomber, kind of the size of our B-25 or B-26. Large flying boats. Again, we sort of used the C-47. We used multi-engine aircraft, um, uh, you know, standard aircraft for most of our transportation needs. And, and, and the Japanese, Japanese used a lot of very large float planes, including Allied codename Emily and Allied codename Mavis. Uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. This is a Judy. Um, I found this in a group of pictures that the U.S. took after a, one of their strikes. Um, this aircraft had obviously crash landed on the reef and was just stranded there. And so you're going through all these pictures of just coral reef, coral reef, coral reef, and then it's like, boom, airplane. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And then, of course, lots of zeros, Zeeks, a Zeke, allied with codename Zeke, which is the second, is the sort of V2 of the uh, version two of the zero. Um, and this, which is actually, oops, excuse me, which is actually a, uh, a roof, allied code name roof, which is a zero float plane, which is, again, back to their seaplanes. There's lots of seaplanes there. And these roofs actually did get up in the air and start to fight and uh, getting dogfights with American Hellcats uh, as the invasion began. So what's the US doing? Well. <clears throat> By 1944, uh, starting with uh, the Flintlock operation to take Kwajalein and, and Roy Moore, we uh, put together, the U.S. Navy put together the uh, what's called Task Force 58, um, which was 12, brand, well, 12, including four brand new air aircraft carriers, Essex-class aircraft carriers. It was a massive fleet. This is uh, the fleet sitting here in 1944 in Majuro. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Marshall Islands, led by Rear Admiral Mark Mitchell. You know, this is the most powerful naval ass uh, assault um, unit, I would say, in the war at that time. There's nothing else bigger than this at that time. Um, and the U.S. essentially with going between 12 and 14 aircraft carriers, and I'll talk about the numbers, the sheer number of aircraft 
that are going to be used with these aircraft carriers the u s is going to be able to harass member that big the big ocean that we're in they're going to be able to harass the japanese all the way south to rabaul up to iwo jima over to palau new guinea and and still be able to invade truck without the japanese sort of knowing what our next move was our list of aircraft a little more simple <laughs> a little more simple on the top left up there workhorse tbm 1c avenger or, T, or uh, tbf 1c avenger uh, which was uh, the tor torpedo bomber down below it you remember from the first slide it's an sbd dauntless the old workhorse from uh, the battle of midway um, with the mo was the most common dive bomber that you would see at this time um, the USS Bunker Hill was flying Hell Divers, SB 2C Hell Divers. And of course, the fighter was the F 6F Hellcat at this time. <clears throat> so, lots of detail up there, but I just wanted to sort of put together an exact list of all the aircraft that are going to be included on these carriers. <coughs> Excuse me. There are four task groups in Task Force 58, three of which are going to be going to truck. There's Task Force 58.1, which has the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and the Bellow Wood, carrying 200 aircraft between the three carriers, led by Rear Admiral John Blackjack Reeves. Task Group 30, uh, 58.2, the Essex, brand new air aircraft carriers, uh, the Intrepid and the Cabot, light carrier, the Cabot, carrying 214 aircraft for those three carriers, led by Rear Admiral Alfred Montgomery. Task Group 58.3, carrying 153 more aircraft. Bunker Hill, the Monterey, and the Cowpens. Now these light carriers would often be used as uh, um, combat action patrol, sort of protecting against uh, assaulting Japanese aircraft that might try to come out and get the carriers. But altogether, Task Force 58 is carrying 567 combat aircraft, which is a lot. And even, you know, the most heavily built up air bases of the Japanese in the Pacific did not have anywhere near that many aircraft. Truck comes close. Truck comes close, but not quite. So again, as I mentioned, we didn't know anything about Truck Lagoon until February 4th, 1944, <clears throat> when uh, two brave uh, Marine, no, no, no shocker there, two brave Marine crews flying PB-4Ys from Marine Photographic Squadron VMD-254 uh, flew all the way from Bougainville at 30,000 feet in horrific weather, from what I hear, until they got over, over the site, captured this photograph and one other photograph, which showed, <clears throat> I know we can all see exactly what ships these are in this picture, which showed essentially the combined fleet, including the Musashi, their soup, one of the super battleships, at anchor here in Truck Lagoon. This looks like a pretty sweet spot then, that you need to go and get it right away. Interestingly, um, the, uh, one of the Marine uh, pilots, they, they actually got separated. The weather was so bad, and one of the Marine pilots decided he didn't get good enough pictures. Now remember, this is the first time American planes have flown over a truck, ever. And now, you have these two planes flying over, they're getting shot at, the Japanese are launching tons and tons of zeros in the strategic bombing survey, they said that we launched as many aircraft as we could launch, and one of these aircraft turned around and did it again in order to get those photographs. They both made it home safely. The weather was so bad that the Japanese said they could not locate <coughs> the aircraft. So for February 1944, now we've got a good picture of what is going to be happening, what's at Truck Lagoon. But the Japanese uh, have a pretty good idea now that we know and probably have taken pictures that something may be on the way. So on February 10th, Admiral Koga 
drives the combined fleet right out of Truck Lagoon and says, okay, we're not coming back here. This is it. And what's left at Truck Lagoon then is going to be much of the merchant fleet and any other ships that are under repair, can't move on their own, or get stuck there because of bad weather in the intervening period. Uh, so, which is going to be a lot of ships, and uh, I'll show you some great photographs from the raid itself. All right, let's get to day one. So, Task Force 58 gets to about 120 miles east of Truck Lagoon overnight on 16 February. <clears throat> and in the morning on 17 February, it begins launching strikes. The plan essentially is to use these 500 and some aircraft in order to have constant attacks on Truck Lagoon for two days straight. Just when one group of plane comes in, when they leave, another group of plane is gonna be coming in. It will be absolutely const, uh, constant. Their goal is to annihilate all the airfields, all the air defenses, and all the ships in the lagoon. Destroy the whole thing. They start, of course, with a pre-dawn fighter sweep where they send up all the Hellcats. Um, each a uh, carrier is given a strike number, so uh, Task Force 58.1 is given strike 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and on. <clears throat> the Hellcats are launched in the morning for the pre-dawn fighter sweep, and they're met with uh, a prepared enemy. The Japanese didn't, they must have gotten some kind of word that the carrier force was some in the area, because the fighters were met with Japanese fighters. There was some surprise. There, some pilots reported that um, they saw Japanese pilots wearing pajamas. And, so, and you know, um, I certainly I think partially what may have happened is that you remember what the, what the lagoon looked like. You have to take boats, Daihatsu as they were, little landing craft to get from island to island. So if some pilots were on Dublon, the main administrative island, perhaps they needed to get back. Um, <clears throat> Dogfights ensued where, um, for the most part, the Hellcat was superior to every uh, aircraft out there. And for the aircraft, it, it was, you know, the, the Zeke was a good match, but the pilots were of not great skill. They didn't, uh, one of the things that I saw constantly in the action reports was that the Japanese were very bad at working together. Um, that the, uh, the American... Um, the American fighter pilots were much better at using teamwork in order to, to shoot down aircraft. And so um, we did, however, lose several Hellcats um, uh, to, different, to different incidents. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about a couple of, of the, uh, the aircraft we lost. Uh, but this is just a great little photo of what it looks like. Um, you know, one of the great things about uh, about this time, once we get to 1944, is that our photography is getting better and better. The photography that's in the aircraft are getting better and better. And this is what it looks like. All the ships of the 4th Fleet, here's the blonde, here's the duck, the duck beak right here. All the ships, as soon as uh, airplanes start flying over, they start running. Many of them don't even pull up their anchors. If they can move, they're running. And so when we've, uh, as I mentioned, we've sort of map the, the sea floor, and you can see huge anchor scars where they're just dragging the anchor as best as they can because they didn't have time to raise it. Um, let's keep on here. Here's a great shot of the, uh, the seaplane base uh, at Dublin, and <clears throat> if you ever get a chance, just, you know, Google Truck Lagoon, um, attack photos and you'll be able to see the very high res photographs that we have but the this is the all these are all seaplanes right here is one large four engine seaplane at emily or mavis but there are in my count i think there are 75 to 100 seaplanes on that ramp not going anywhere they're getting strafed they're getting bombed and they're under constant constant attack First, uh, the first targets, of course, are going to be anything that's in the air. 
The second targets are going to be the airfields to make sure no other targets get into the air. And then the third is going to be the ships in the lagoon and finally major uh, base installations um, on Dablon and, and on some of the other islands as well, radar, etc. cetera. Uh, another great photo from that morning. Uh, interesting story, uh, anyone here heard of uh, Pappy Boynton, right? Marine uh, pilot, Corsair pilot, Bob Bob Black Sheep. Well, he was taken prisoner. And as I was going through some of the war crimes records um, for a truck, I, I saw that he had a deposition. So it turns out Pappy Boynton, and I hope this isn't uh, something you've all heard of several times, Pappy Boynton was on a transport plane on February 17th that arrived just as the American attack was beginning. He was on a, sorry, a Japanese transport plane. He was a POW. And they landed on this bomber strip on a 10, threw them all into a revetment where they had to sit out the entire attack that I'm about to tell you, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm talking about today. He survived. Him and five others all survived and went on to, uh, to, to be a prisoner at truck for a few days before going on to Japan. Uh, but very interesting and, and, and unfortunate timing. Let's talk about one of the crews, the Bridges crew. This is Lieutenant James Edwin Bridges. Bridges was a pilot in VT-6, I'm sorry, yeah, VT-6. Um, with the Intrepid. And uh, he was an Avenger pilot. This is actually his aircraft. Oops. This is actually his aircraft. Uh, they're loading up a, uh, a bomb that says, uh, from the USS Intrepid to the Honorable Hirohito. Um, and that's actually one month before he goes missing. This is a great shot of what an Avenger looks like. These are Intrepid Avengers flying in Bridges had a crew with uh, <clears throat> gunner Robert Bruton and uh, radioman James Green. The three of them had all been experienced. They had just received honorable, uh, well, just received honors for uh, bravery um, from the attack, the flintlock attack, um, for diving low in order to make sure that he could achieve um, a hit on a Japanese ship. Now, one thing uh, I forgot to mention is that uh, these are Avengers, right? These are torpedo planes. But what we found, of course, that many of you probably have read about, is that our torpedoes were pretty bad in World War II. So a lot of what we did, especially with attacks like this, where there were mixed ground and uh, sea targets, is they loaded up the Avengers with bombs, and they just became dive bombers, essentially. And that's what's happening here. So here's Dublon again. This is the main target, of course. This is the Japanese island. The two major anchorages, this is Eten Anchorage over here to the east. This is Dublon Anchorage over here to the west. These are where almost all of the ships were when the battle began. And this ship here is called the Aikoko Maru, Aikoku Maru was a freighter passenger liner that was converted into an attack transport. It was carrying, at the time, mines, torpedoes, ammunition. It, was, it had just arrived the night before and just was staying overnight to get provisions to head back to Tokyo. <clears throat> it was full of soldiers that it was also transporting. Some say up to 600 soldiers were aboard uh, at the time of this attack. As you can see, in F-10 Anchorage, it was one of the largest ships uh, and presented one of the best targets uh, as the planes were coming through. On Strike 2B, which uh, came, I think, arrived over the lagoon around 9.30 or 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, Bridges, along with several other Avengers and, and uh, Dauntlesses, saw the Ico Kamaru and, and attacked. Unfortunately for Bridges, either his bomb or a bomb from an Avenger before him that came before him 
detonated everything inside that ammunition ship and resulted in one of the largest explosions that many of the pilots said they had ever seen. Um, and uh, reading any unit that was flying during that time noted this explosion. And this is, think of it, this is a time when everything's exploding. You're dropping bombs everywhere. Massive explosion, which caught Bridges in the explosion, and he, we believe, is seen here, here, whoop, right here, flying out of control, out of the explosion. And we have a letter to his uh, parents uh, to that effect from uh, someone who was a witness who said they saw him emerge from the explosion out of control, crashing into the scene. Many more sorties were flown that day, but uh, Bridges was never seen again. So, after the attack, uh, at about uh, dusk, uh, American planes retreated back to their carriers in order to get some rest, some, uh, some relaxation. But overnight, the torpedo bombers of the USS Enterprise, of Torpedo Squadron 10, uh, conducted the very first nighttime radar-guided bombing uh, done, by, uh, done by Avengers in the Pacific. It was 2 a.m. using ASB-6 radars. Each Avenger had four 500-pound bombs. When they arrived over, over Truck Lagoon, this is 2 a.m., right? They were seen, someone, you know, the Japanese obviously were aware that something may happen. And a hospital ship that was located in the northern part of the lagoon threw on its lights in order to try to light up and warn. At that point, spotlights all turned on and anti-aircraft fire started firing. These aircraft have what are called flame dampers on their exhaust. So when they're flying, when, when a plane is flying at night, it looks like it's got flames shooting out from the engine. They have flame dampers on there to prevent that from happening. But apparently, they, many of these Type 1 flame dampers had cracked and they were poorly, poorly made. And so they were easily sighted. And we lost one Avenger that night, somewhere in the lagoon, went missing. One particular spotlight <clears throat> had all of them you know, in their sights. And all of a sudden, as they're crossing into the lagoon, explosions start happening over the islands where they aren't. And what they realize is that there were 12-hour delay, delayed fuse bombs had been dropped on all of these positions and were starting to go off and had silenced several of those spotlights. Um, they claimed 13 direct hits and sank eight ships at 2 a.m. that night. <clears throat> Day two, and you can tell this is day two because on day one, they made sure not to blow up the oil tanks. Once they blew those oil tanks, as you can see, visibility in the lagoon was very poor. That morning, again, same plan. Consistent and constant aerial attack, wave after wave after wave. That morning, action shot of aircraft. This is from the second morning. You can see all those ships that we had seen, some of the earlier stuff, they're all at the bottom now. Some are on their way. American aircraft flying over. Let's talk about the Dean crew. So Ensign Donald Dean was a pilot with VB-10, with VB Bombing Squadron 10 from the USS Enterprise, flying an SPD Dauntless with his crewman J.J. McGorry, James McGorry. Um, and uh, just so happened, so we, you know, part of my job as the historian here is to find every little piece of information. It's like a puzzle. You start with the main action reports, and those are easy. But then you're sort of going into, I found an article written in the 1990s by someone who was on this mission. And in the very top corner, they had this photo, which is Dean here and his crewman facing, which we didn't have a photo yet of this crewman 
gory with their gauntlets uh, just before this mission. Awesome things you find in the archives and stuff. Another great, um, this here, as I mentioned, is called the Blonde Anchorage. It's another deep water anchorage um, off the backside of Dublon. Back here was a, a submarine base, a lot of the ship repair areas. This was where the uh, many, much of the combined fleet, the, the offensive fleets of the destroyers, battleships, um, sat anchor. And on that day, on that morning, two ships remained still on fire from the day before. The Tonon Maru, which was a massive, like 600 foot long whaler um, that many pilots confused for an aircraft carrier. There was one whole squadron that said that they had definitely sunk an aircraft carrier. One of the largest aircraft carriers they could, they'd ever seen. But we think it was actually this. There's no aircraft carriers present. We think it was this whaler here. This is the Hayon Maru down here, also on fire. Um, it was a transport oiler, I believe. Um, and it, the water gets a little bit shallow in these areas. So both of these, I think, this sank eventually and turned on its side. This ship um, just settled and it, it was shallow enough that it was still partially above water. Dean and his crew saw these as two optimal targets of opportunity, as you might. <coughs> Excuse me. And so <clears throat> we have a report from uh, the commander of this squadron who was flying just uh, ahead of Dean. And Dean was coming in, and anti-aircraft, which was very heavy from the backside of Dublon here and the north side of Fefen, another big island up here, anti-aircraft fire was particularly heavy, struck Dean and his crew in their dive. So they were already almost vertical in their dive. They were struck, never pulled out of their dive, and pancaked straight in. And the... Um, <clears throat> The aircraft just in front of him had just pulled out, saw what was happening. The gunner tried to fire at the uh, site where the anti-aircraft was, anti-aircraft fire was coming from, but uh, was, excuse me, was not successful. That's the, so as the, as the operation wrap, wraps up, by the numbers, and again, this is sort of, tell you like how how uh, powerful this invasion was this, this attack was 30 strikes so one strike would be every single carrier launching for 1,400 uh, sorties that's you know 1,400 individual aircraft missions over truck for the two for the two-day battle they estimated the Japanese aircraft in the air and on the ground was 315 that's a lot of aircraft that's a lot of aircraft. With 129, they, they thought, actually made it into the air. 186 remained on the ground and were all destroyed. They estimated of the 55 vessels in the lagoon, 25 were sunk. Um, and that is why, to this day, Truck is one of the most popular diving sites in the world. Um, it is a lot of merchant ships that are just sunk right where they were. U.S. combat losses, I mentioned about 20 aircraft. We have 17 pilots and 15 aircrew lost. Inside the lagoon, we think there are at least eight aircraft with 14 crew from day one, three more aircraft and eight crew from day two. That's lost inside the lagoon. There were several that we know were not inside the lagoon. Um, the USS Intrepid was attacked by a enemy torpedo bomber successfully where it killed, um, it killed 11, six were killed in action and five were still missing in action. It was, by any sense, a tremendously successful attack. In fact, it was reported in the newspapers that Gibraltar of the Pacific Falls, this Pearl Harbor, this Japanese Pearl Harbor has been conquered and they moved on. You know, Palau in March, Marianas in June, <clears throat> all over the Pacific. But these pilots, of course, were still there. And they actually, this task force came back 
in, 19, in April, at the end of April 1944, and in, in a named, but most people don't know the name, post death crate too. So they came back actually from Hollandia in, in New Guinea, <coughs> excuse me, and struck a truck on the way back home. And they lost more aircraft in that operation than they did in the more famous Operation Hailstone because it was bad weather there was a constant ceiling of about 5,000 feet, and so the Japanese had tuned their anti-aircraft right where the Americans were gonna be coming out of the clouds. And so we lost a lot of aircraft that day too. The bombing would continue. Remember, this is a bypassed island, so you can't just let them rebuild. B-24s from the Solomons, from New Guinea, and from the Marshall Islands struck uh, Truck Lagoon twice a week sometimes more at, during the day, at night, and we lost, I'm still counting the number of crews that we lost. Potentially up to 15 B-24 crews lost on strikes to truck. <clears throat> Most of those not inside the lagoon, obviously, but if you do the math, that's almost 150 uh, right there. Uh, and that, again, most people don't really think about. So, <clears throat> let's transition a little bit then to today, what's happening now. So, uh, Chris mentioned that I am the lead historian for Project Recover. Project Recover, our mission is basically to use 21st century technology uh, in order to research, search, locate, and repatriate Americans missing in action from World War II. Uh, and, and forward, World War II and forward, not just World War II. But if you look at the numbers, there are 80,000 missing Americans from our past conflicts, starting with World War II. 72,000 of those are from World War II alone. There's roughly um, 7,000 still from Korea and another less than 2,000 now. I think we're, we're, we're doing pretty good getting the numbers down from Vietnam. Project Recover is a nonprofit that's a partnership between three separate organizations that are independent, but we all work together. University of Delaware, uh, School of Marine Science, uh, and uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and then the nonprofit itself, Project Recover, which has a history going back to an organization called the Bent Prop Project, which was started all the way back in 1993. We've been doing this a long time. We formally became Project Recover in 2012. What do we do? Starting with the historical research that I talked to you about earlier, it starts with us going to the archives, digging, finding action reports, personnel files, photographs, memoirs, talking to World War II veterans, as many as we can. I talked to a 103-year-old pilot who flew on one of these truck missions a few weeks ago, and it was spectacular. Every chance like that, I, I try to get. Planning for our searches. Um, once we find something, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how we do the searches. When we find something, we have a documentation. We have professional archeologists that work with us, underwater archeologists who map out, along with photo mosaics, we, use, we do 3D renderings of, of different sites in order to sort of see, is there going to be a possibility that we're going to be able to get remains off this aircraft? Sometimes it's not the case. Not every aircraft we find has remains still on board. If we believe there are, it leads to a recovery. Project Recover conduct, it used to be just the US government, Project Recover conducted its first ever recovery last year, which was successful, and I'm very excited to say that. Hopefully we'll have some good news soon about that. Going to back to the government then, those remains are sent to a lab in Omaha or Hawaii, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, where <laughs> forensic anthropologists will take a look at the bones, forensic odontologists will take a look at the teeth, if, they, if we have them, and cut for DNA which is sent back to Delaware to the uh, Armed Forces DNA Lab at uh, Dover Air Force Base. And then hopefully internment being the final, the final uh, part of this. And I can tell you, tell you a cool story about that. So types of searches that we do. 
We do terrestrial search, of course, looking for aircraft that crashed on land. This is part of our, 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 our job. It's something we do all the time. At Truck Lagoon, uh, we don't know of any aircraft that crashed on land, but what we do know is that many airmen, some of those missing people that I talked about, those 20 aircraft, um, were captured, but they never made a home. And we know from war crimes documents, from trials that occurred, that there are executed Americans uh, on the islands in truck. And so we have done terrestrial searches for execution sites, um, using information from brave Korean laborers and local Chukis, um, men and women who basically told on the Japanese. And they, they actually had kept it a secret for a long time. Uh, but they finally opened up. And so we have lots of transcripts going into where potentially American uh, men were, American servicemen were buried after being executed. But what our specialty is at Project Recover is underwater search. It's a capacity that we have that no other major organization doing this work has. Uh, in fact, even the Defense Department often contracts us to do this work. We use autonomous underwater vehicles. It's called a Remus 100. It looks a little bit like a torpedo. It's loaded up with sensors, including side scan sonar and magnetometry, photography, uh, and we're still every day, we're adding new sensors onto these uh, onto these systems in order to help us uh, basically tell the difference between what's underwater and an aircraft. An aircraft that crashes, I told you the nature of some of those crashes, they don't look like airplanes anymore. This one is a, <laughs> you know, that's a ditched airplane that pilot probably got out and everything. Most of these aircraft that we're looking for are obliterated. You cannot often tell the difference between them and a piece of coral or a rock. We use these vehicles to map uh, the water in what essentially is a mowing the lawn pattern. It just sort of goes like this. We computer program it the night before. We use the historical sources, everything that we've got in order to create uh, our best guess, which is never right on the first try, our best guess of where that airplane should be, and then run the vehicles. And it looks like this. Each one of these well, you know, they're all different colors. Each one of those is a different mission. And if we can, we can stitch them all together and we can see what the underwater landscape looks like. So here's what it looks like for Truck Lagoon. We've mapped so far since 2018. We first stepped foot uh, in Truck in uh, 2018. <clears throat> we had to stop at the end of 2019, obviously. We had planned to go back. We mapped 70 square kilometers. Again, I know it's a little bit farther away. Here's the blonde here, Moen, Bethan, Param. Each one of these is, of course, a targeted search for an aircraft that we think has crashed there. But many of those places, we look and look and look, and there's nothing. However, I told you about Donald Dean and his crew. In October of 2019, we found him. Found an SPD Dauntless right in the spot where I had uh, talked to you about earlier. I say right in the spot. It's a, it's a needle in a stack of needles, let me tell you. There's some tremendously talented engineers looking at the information that's coming at us of the underwater surface. And they see things, um, in this case, it's this coral fan wheel that's attached to this propeller lit up in our data. And so we said, oh, we should go check that out. And that is Dean. This is a very small site. This is that SPD. Again, in its dive, everything matched right up. In its dive, pancakes straight into the water, just crushed. We are very, very hopeful that we'll be able to bring that crew home. I, I hope so. Bridges. We found a TBM Avenger. 
right where bridges should be. Now there are many other TBM Avengers that were lost during this operation, and we have not yet been able to absolutely identify this aircraft, but we think that this is the Bridges TBM. The crash profile matches, it is definitely an Avenger. And even if it's not Bridges, it's one of those crews. Every Avenger that was lost in this area is a missing Avenger with a missing with three missing men on board. Huge success for us in October of 2019. In fact, we found two aircraft, I, st I showed you those little mowing the lawn lines. We found two aircraft at the tip of each of one single line, one mission, which was unheard of, really, really neat. These are the first American aircraft ever located in Truck Lagoon. It is, there's, it's local lore at Truck that all the American pilots were so good that they were all able to make it outside of the lagoon and crash. Of course, we know that that's not the case. And hopefully we'll be able to bring some of these guys home. Why do we do this? This is about the families for us. Um, you know, one of the most common questions I get is sort of why, how are there even families to care anymore? We're, we're so far away from the actual event. But I can tell you, we get emails. I've gotten two emails today. We get emails every single day from a family member searching for their lost loved one. It's the same as a cold case in the United States. You know, there's documentaries every day about all these famous cold cases. And those families are still hurting, and so are these families. They never got, I don't like to say closure, but they never got resolution. They never got even an idea of what happened, where they were. In some cases, their families have made up stories to cope with the loss about amnesia. Maybe they just, you know, bonked their head and they're living with a family happily in New Guinea somewhere. And uh, these families still really care. And one of the most touching ones I ever went to, this down here is big family reunion, took place in Portage, Pennsylvania. Uh, Walter Mintis, uh, air crewman on an Avenger that we found in Palau. And the entire town came out. It was a November day. It was 35 degrees and raining. It was disgusting. Every school was out with American flags as the remains came through town. Everyone came out to the burial. And the family had a massive reunion that they invited us to, which we were absolutely excited to do. So we do it for the families. That, for us, is, is really the most important By the numbers, we've done so far 21 countries. Uh, we've located over 65 American aircraft. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Project Recover, but we just had uh, a news uh, article come out. We just found five B-24s in one mission off uh, in the Adriatic Sea, off Croatia. Um, could be up to, we think, up to 30 MIAs associated with those B-24. So I just actually just updated them. Uh, 70 missing Americans associated with the USS Abner Reed, uh, which was a destroyer that was lost um, off Kiska. It was actually hit a mine. Half the destroyer sank. The destroyer actually lived on and then was sunk again in the Philippines. But 70 sailors were still, uh, and we found the aft end of that um, in, uh, or the forward end of that in, uh, in 2016, 2017, excuse me. Uh, 15 repatriated Americans so far. So you can see the difference. We've located 65 aircraft. We've only had 15 Americans come back home to their resting places. There is a lot of work to be done. This is a very slow process. We have outpaced the, the American, you know, the, the US government by far, We've, we're locating aircraft so fast, it's, it's all just building up. And recoveries uh, take a long time. They're very expensive uh, in order to get those guys back home. So that number 15 should be, and hopefully will be, over 100 and 150, I'm hoping, in the next few years, once those recoveries begin, including 
the two that we found, the three actually that we found in the truck were good. That's it. That's it for me. Um, this little QR code, if you want a t-shirt or a hat or something, you get 25% discount. Um, and, uh, oh, one more thing. Um, a documentary, we have a documentary called To What Remains. And you can find it on Amazon, Apple, uh, anywhere you can rent, rent a movie. Um, it's about bringing home Walter Mintis and that crew. Um, and it's really, really well done. So I would definitely highly recommend it. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Sure, I left something out, uh, so let's have questions. Help me if I miss context. If you got a question, I want to hear it. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, question, answer, period. I'll come around with the mic and answer them right up here. Okay. Present text. A couple of aircraft questions. Yes. Sir. That first uh, aerial shot of truck. Yeah. Uh, the plane in the lower right hand side. Uh, looked like a B-24, but it, was that a Navy version of the B-24? Uh, I know what you're talking about. Yes, it was. It was a PB-4Y. TB-4Y. PB, uh, as in Papa P. PB-4Y was a Navy uh, Liberator variant. It was like a B-24, but made for the Navy. Okay. Another question I had, uh, they were using the TBM Avengers as dive bombers. Were they equipped that way, or was that theater modified? To use them as they, dive bombers. They could always carry bombs if needed. So they could carry both. You could go one mission with a thousand pound torpedo, you can go the next mission with four or five or two thousand pound torpedo, you can go the next mission with four or five hundred pound bombs. Okay. Question. How many losses do we have, aircraft losses during during the attack? During Hailstone we lost twenty aircraft. 20 aircraft, and uh, I think it was 37 crew total. Um, yes, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, once the, uh, the remains are recovered, or you're recovering the remains, how do you differentiate between a piece of coral and a small bone fragment? I mean, there's kind of tough. It is kind of tough. Uh, we actually, how it works too, is we break up the, the plane. The plane is, you know, the plane is not the point. The plane is just a way for us to find the remains. So the recovery process is a destructive process. We break up the plane. We do suction. We use giant dredge and suction up the all around the aircraft. It all goes through quarter inch mesh. And you're not, coral, there is stuff that looks like bone. The bone is very specific, but we'll always have an archaeologist with us who can tell the difference. So if someone gets confused, maybe it's bone, maybe it's not, usually we put it, you know, we save everything that we think could be bone, that is gone through again, and then those go with a dignified transfer ceremony back to um, Hickam in Hawaii. So it's a good question, but for the most part, those guys know the difference. Oh, President Bush flew the Avenger. Yep. Was he in one of those squadrons in there? That's a great question. The San Jacinto was not here at the time. They, they, they were not part of Task Force 58. But uh, in the documentary, uh, so Pat Scannon, who was a co-founder of Project Recover, he uh, was searching for aircraft in Palau. And of course, uh, Bush lost his wingman, a Lieutenant Houle, in Palau. And we found that aircraft, and we were able to tell uh, President Bush before he passed away that we had found that aircraft. Uh, Pat uh, developed a relationship with President Bush, who remembered very well exactly what happened when Hula went missing. It was very important for us to be able to find that aircraft. So all of that is really well documented in the documentary, but it's a good question. Oh, yeah. Was truck a German entity and then went to Japan after World War One? That's exactly right. Uh, the Germans had it, and then in 1914, uh, after 1914, uh, when the Germans could not protect, they, they declared war, they could not protect their possessions, the Japanese moved in to many of those German possessions, including um, uh, Palau and those places. Um, a question about the 
process itself and the partnership between scripts and I'm a proud road hand, so you know, we're getting that over. Ah. Um, who owns the ship? Uh, who, you know, what is the the contribution of each of those uh, organizations to to the project? Right. Great question. So we don't have an individual ship. We contract ships. We can we can operate out of a skiff. We don't need a big uh, research vessel. <coughs> Generally, when Scripps is involved, we do have they have much larger teams. They have usually larger ships because they have larger teams. University of Delaware, we're more flexible. We have smaller teams, so we'll have teams of like, we could send four people out to operate two or three Remus vehicles, which can cover probably five square kilometers per day of ocean floor, which is, which is a tremendous amount compared to scuba diving and just looking at the ocean floor. Um, and so we all choose our missions together based on the best you know, prioritization with historical data. You know, one of the nice things about um, Truck Lagoon, you can fly to Truck Lagoon on United Airlines. Um, and so for us, it is an easy place to operate. And, and, and so all three entities have operated a truck by itself. Sometimes Scripps does its own missions. Sometimes the University of Delaware does its own. Did that, help? Did that answer your question? There is no one ship anyway. We tried to buy Paul Allen's ship, but couldn't couldn't afford it. Yes, sir. Oh, have, have you found, and, and if you did, um, foreign aircraft from previous enemies, and do you do you get cooperation from foreign governments? And we absolutely have found foreign aircraft, um, Nazi aircraft, and Japanese aircraft, and British aircraft as well. Um, and we notify those governments. Um, usually we don't get an answer back, <clears throat> but we make sure that they know, especially if it's a new find, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Um, how did they have stuff? How did they have stuff? How do you find stuff? How do we find stuff, right. Well, let's see, we have a big screen, a big TV screen, and it has a waterfall, what we call a waterfall, and it's the data as the vehicle is moving across the ocean, it's producing a waterfall of data. And so every night, we stay up very late, even though we've worked already all day long, and we're exhausted, and we stare at that television screen until something that all of us agree is weird pops up. Now usually I love being there because every rock that comes along I think is something interesting and they tell me I'm stupid. But um, those guys have studied um, and developed side scan sonar for a living and so they know exactly what they're looking at. And so that's how, that's how we search. Uh, you mentioned Paul Allen. How many different organizations are there that are doing similar types of things to what you do? There are, uh, there are no organizations that use autonomous vehicles uh, to do the work that we are doing. There are lots of private organizations that will use tow-behind scanning. Um, there are organizations like History Flight, which does a lot of ground work in places like Tarawa, searching for lost graves. Um, and, and lots of land, uh, lots of universities are taking part now in archaeological digs in Europe. So University of Illinois, University of Wisconsin, University of New Orleans, lots of different uh, universities do that kind of stuff. But we're the only, we're the only organization that goes from research all the way to recovery. Besides actual remains, do you find other artifacts, dog tags, wedding rings, things of that nature that help identify the uh, original owner? If we're lucky. There was one case, a TBM Avenger that we located, where we found remains of two individuals. One had been the turret gunner, and everything that we found was preserved. Not like, you know, perfectly preserved, obviously there's skeletal remains, but there was um, a wallet with identification bracelets and 
all you could everything is in one place. The uh, so he was the gunner. The radio men who had been in the radio compartment, you know, we didn't find any material evidence. So it depends sometimes. And we look for that kind of stuff because that'll obviously at least help us identify the airplane at the very least. I mentioned there are several Avengers. So when we find remains at this site, no matter what, we have to include, get DNA from all the families of every single crewman. So, good question. Are there any further questions? Uh, I can bring the mic to you. I think everyone's, all the questions have been answered, it looks like. Okay, so before we close, I, um, I have a gift I want to give. Oh, thank you. All so right, much. present. And I, I'm not guaranteed it's going to be a priceless artifact or anything for you, but um, we always give the traditional coffee mug. Oh, excellent. I know some of our board members like to say you can have other beverages with that too. Oh, good, good. It's up to you. I'll Thanks pour so water much. in there. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll just send another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And talk to uh, Colin if you want after here. Uh, shake his hand and talk to him if you'd like to. Also, don't forget our helmet committees in the back, and the gentlemen are happy to take any donations that you might be kind enough to give us. Once again, that's optional, but we do appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time in uh, the next meeting in uh, February. Thank you.